can present. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin March, and I'm joined by my colleague, Cheryl Jansen. We're both here at Education Consultants, and today we're going to talk about incorporating test prep at home. So lots of different strategies for thinking about, first of all, why doing ACT and SAT prep is still important, even in these really challenging times, and then also just how to stay motivated. Um, one thing I'll say before we really jump into this is it doesn't, obviously we're primarily focused on the, the two tests today, but really this is like a, a useful set of strategies and tips for staying motivated kind of in everything you do and all your school work and you know, even work life for some adults. Um, so we'll get started. All right, so yeah, talking about the outline, the major topics of discussion. Uh, the first is gonna be the importance of summer testing. And so basically um, we know that we're hearing lots of like news items that, you know, and reports coming out that, oh, such and such school went test optional or, you know, has changed their policy on the testing process through, you know, for this admission cycle at least. And that's great. Um, and kudos to those schools for making those changes. But really, I think um, in a lot of cases, it, at this point at least, it's going to be a small faction of the total number of schools have gone test optional or kind of changed the requirements. Um, so, you know, like it or not, you'll probably still need to take the SAT or ACT, especially if you're not, you know, applying to college in the fall, um, because a lot of what's going to happen is a lot of these colleges are going to go back to their normal, you know, testing requirements once hopefully the crisis passes in the fall. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the impact on ACT testing specifically for COVID um, and talk a little bit about the ramifications for the SAT as well. Um, and then we'll kind of switch to the second half where we'll talk more about the best ways to incorporate test prep into your schedule for your student. Um, so, we can, you know, they're kind of motivational tricks, useful hints and strategies. Um, being accountable and why that matters is one of the main things. And then obviously in, you know, in the spirit of staying at home, uh, online and other test prep resources that are accessible without the traditional classes and all that, um, all that jazz. So a little bit about me, um, my name's Kevin, as you know. So I've done about four years of college, like educational consulting and test prep. Uh, I started with FIRAT in December 2019, so I've only been here a few months, but I've worked in a lot of capacities sort of outside of, um, you know, before FIRAT, and then I'm, I'm really excited to get started here. I have over 2,000 hours of college admissions consulting experience, um, and then an additional about 1,500 hours or so of SAT and ACT tutoring. Um, I mainly focus on the SAT, so I'm going to let Cheryl talk more about the ACT. Um, over 200 college acceptances, 10 of those were IVs, and then three international acceptances. I've personally visited over 30 college campuses, um, which is exciting. I really love to visit. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's really fun for me. And then last but certainly not least, um, over a million in total merit-based scholarships. So that's, that's really exciting because obviously affordability is at the center of all this. And I'll let Cheryl introduce herself. Hi, thanks, Kevin. Um, it, I was really glad that Kevin mentioned that he has a lot of experience in the uh, SAT, and then I bring the experience, some experience for ACT, kind of allows us to bring a good balance to this testing at home uh, webinar. Um, so a little bit about me. I have been in education for 27 years. Uh, some of that as a counselor, some of that as, as a career counselor, and a lot as an English teacher. So I really enjoy that moment of helping students work on their um, scholarship essays, their admissions essays. Um, I have just joined Farat Education and I'm super excited in April, but I have about three years of college consulting otherwise in addition to that. Um, I have over 5,000 consulting hours on college admissions between um, guidance office and counseling office and individual working with students. Um, and I have visited over 20 colleges myself. I agree with uh, Kevin that getting out on the campus is a fun and it's exciting and um, 
really one of the most important things that you're going to do before you choose a college is decide is to get onto that campus. Um, and I have over 15 hours, oh, sorry, 1500 hours of ACT prep. That means tutoring in small groups, one on one, large group sessions. And then the last thing is I have over a million in merit based aid, um, helping students get those high end scholarships. Um, again, because college needs to be affordable. So that's about me. Um, so yeah, so as mentioned a few minutes ago, the first thing we're going to talk about is the importance of testing this summer. Um, and Cheryl's going to walk us through some of the major changes to the, to the ACT starting in September 2020. So just a few months away. Right. So um, back earlier this year, ACT launched um, this really great, fun and exciting moment for a lot of students in the past if you wanted to um, retest the ACT, even if you just needed to retake one section, you had to retake the whole test. Um, so that meant that you didn't really have an opportunity to just bring up one score, which is what a lot of students happen. So they'll go in, they'll do really well on two or three of the sections, and then one of the sections kind of drags that composite score down. And so earlier this year, ACT announced that they would be allowing subject test retest only um, starting in September of 2020. So that's really an awesome opportunity. So for my students who are really strong in math and sciences, that gives them a chance to really work uh, before that September rolls around and work on those English and reading strategies and know that I just have to take these two tests. You can retake um, up to three subject tests. Um, obviously, you wouldn't retake four because that's the whole test. And ACT's whole idea behind this is that they understand that that test is just a snapshot of what a student can do. Um, and so it's pretty awesome that they understand and are actually looking for ways uh, for um, colleges to allow students to present their best face to colleges. So that's a really um, awesome way. A lot of schools. Um, you can choose at this point what you want to do with your scores. So when you send them to those future colleges, you can say, hey, send only my composite scores um, for my full tests, or you can have ACT send your super score. So if you know about super scoring, um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. What it is is if you take that test four times and in each time you get a higher score in one of the four categories, English, math, reading, or science, they will take the best of those four scores and send that, even if it was on four different tests, to your prospective colleges. So as of right now, we're still waiting for colleges to decide if they are going to accept that super score or if they still just want that one snapshot picture of what a student did in that one time setting. All of this depends on one very important factor, and that is you have got to take the ACT before September in order to be eligible for those subject retests. And that's a big deal because a lot of the spring tests were canceled. And so you have two times to take that um, ACT before September, and that is June 13th and July 18th. The really tricky part is if you're going to register for the ACT in June, you need to do that by May 8th, which is Friday by May 8th. So that's a lot of those fun things that ACT is announcing. It's really um, a great move for students. I'm super excited about that move for my kids because I think it's really going to give them a chance to really showcase what they do well. Yeah, that's a great point, Cheryl. Um, I think for some reason it, it's still like May 1st in my mind. It, it just like is perpetually May 1st. So you should really, uh, but obviously like you should really look into registering, especially for that June ACT because it's coming up and the deadline's only four days away at this point. Um, yeah. Is that Friday? Yeah, that's Friday. Yeah, it's Friday. Um, so yeah, making that kind of quick decision and th that's another great example of why you want to be on top of this stuff, you know, even during the COVID crisis. And you know what, Kevin, I totally forgot to mention the other change that they made is they are moving to this idea of potentially online testing. Um, if you're a student, you know the angst that comes with waiting for those scores to come. They're in your little inbox and you're constantly checking 
to get that information. Um, they're going to give students starting in September in certain locations an option to test online and saying that students can then have their results back in two days, which is kind of a big deal for a lot of our students. So um, it'll be interesting to see. I know a couple colleges have already put out some information saying, yeah, we're not going to go with that information. Mm. We would rather have no test scores at all than um, to take something if a student took it online at home. So it's going to be interesting if they're going to make a distinguished uh, a, a, distinguishment between taking it online and taking it online at home. So um, I'm kind of curious as to where that's going to go. But that's the other change that ACT has made um, this year in 2020. So yeah, that, that's really interesting because um, I mean, obviously, like there's, we're starting to see a little bit of variation in some, some of the policies, like at least with AP exams, um, not every but a number of colleges have come out and said that we're going to take the, the so the test just for background the test has been shortened to like 45 minutes in most cases um in only one section yeah. but a lot of colleges they're still saying we'll award credit you know as we traditionally have you know for the the scores that we do so if it's for example umass amherst it would probably be above a three in most cases um but it's interesting that now some colleges are kind of drawing a line in terms of saying well the act you know, if you take it online from home, we can't trust that score. I, I kind of wonder, like I took the GRE a few years ago because I'm currently in grad school. And I, I wonder if they'll eventually move it to like almost all online, but kind of in testing centers, like because that's how the GRE is administered in most cases. Right. Right. Um, but that's yeah. kind of a, a side note. Um, and we'll see kind of how that evolves. Right, yeah. Um, um, so, go ahead. Well, I was just going to go on to that next slide, which is the top sites for um, prep um, that we kind of looked at. And so this, again, this is geared towards ACT, um, but you can find, and uh, Kevin will add those top sites for a or SAT as we go along. Um, one of the first ones that I have out there is this idea of ACT Academy. Um, I've been using ACT Academy for a few years now, and they just keep making it better and better, which is really awesome and exciting. Um, the really tricky part is when you actually go in, you want to put ACT Academy and that takes you to a really funky website that you don't want to be to. It's actually, the website is actually academy.act.org. And so once you get there, um, it's much more user friendly. Uh, what I like about this site is it has a ton of information, including videos and quizzes um, that will help you along the way and brush up on some skills that you may um, have lost or made room for other things as I like to tell my students. What I really like about this um, program, this one, it will allow you to input your uh, first set of scores and then once you start taking quizzes it will it kind of learns you as a student so it has this AI function built in and it starts giving you questions that will help you build your scores so if you were hey here my, my friend use my ACT program and it's on your laptop um, then they're going to be taking tests off of your profile which is a little creepy at the same time and um, so but maybe who knows? Um, the next one that I have is Prep Factory. Uh, I love this organization. They do some great stuff all the time. So if you are not signed up for their um, emails and blogs, it is a great place to get awesome information on all things tests, whether it's AP, SAT, ACT, um, all the acronyms. They have got some good information out there for, for you. They also will have um, a listing of I think five full practice tests that had been released by ACT, which is kind of a big deal. So um, the next one I have is the Magoosh ACT blog. It's just fun to say Magoosh actually. So, so as you're looking at that one, you'll want to, um, it'll help you learn what to study and how to study. They actually have a free app, which is why this one kind of made the top of my list because you know my students in particular are so tied for their to their phones, especially when they're in class and stuff. And so, I mean, I know, man, as soon as they get an opportunity, they're checking their phones. And so this app gives them a chance to do like questions of the day and study questions. Um, and it's delivered right to them in a mode of technology that they're very familiar with. 
Um, there is also Best ACT Prep YouTube channel. And while it doesn't have new content, it does have a little over 50 some videos that are awesome. Slightly on the boring side, but really good um, uh, stuff that will help remind you what this test is going to look like and the skills that you're going to be tested over. Um, and then the last one is um, Khan Academy, which is, well, I have two. I'm going to talk about two. I think I'm cheating and putting in one that might not be on there. But um, Khan Academy is fabulous when it comes to math. They're a great resource, um, especially for the math and science section. And Grammar Bites does for English and reading what Khan does for the math and science. So that's really um, pretty cool. Um, it also offers several resources, the Grammar Bites. Um, so that it'll give you daily practice and Twitter um, tips that will help review topics and just kind of keep those in the forefront instead of, oh, I think I know what that is because on test day, you don't have a whole lot of time to try to recall that information. Yeah, that's, that's great, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, I think just in terms of the, to add to that from the SAT perspective, um, Honestly, a lot of the same resources are useful, obviously not ACT Academy, but I really recommend Khan Academy because they've partnered directly with the College Board. And that's one thing where, we'll talk about this in a minute with the books, but that's one thing where you really want to, like one of my best, I guess one of my best pieces of advice is to try to like practice, do practice problems that are designed by, you know, the company that or like at least in partnership with the college board for the SAT and then the ACT for the ACT test. Um, that it, so that, that cause those are always like the closest to the actual test. Um, sometimes the other ones are great in a lot of cases, um, but sometimes you want to, like sometimes they're not quite like worded in the way that you would probably see on the test or, you know, they're kind of asking slightly different things. Um, so I really recommend Khan Academy for the SAT. One thing that I remember reading, I think maybe about a year ago, is that if you spend like something like 20 hours, so students who spend roughly 20 hours on Khan Academy just doing the SAT content, see their scores go up like over 100 points on average after they've done that. So that's, I mean, that's a great, you know, obviously a great boost and it's free. Um, so that that's good. It's very personalized. It gets like that kind of practice in. I, I definitely second what Cheryl said about the Prep Academy as well and Magoosh. Um, I think just like looking for YouTube channels like more generally and looking kind of into looking for like specific people who really match your style of learning is a good thing because there's so much content on YouTube these days that like if there's a tutor who you know doesn't put you to sleep or you know kind of keeps you engaged but really teaches the content well um, I think definitely you know go into it with a critical lens and try to see, you know, like if it's how authentic it is or how accurate it is. But if you if you can kind of see that it matches the content in other resources and, um, you know, they're engaging or kind of engage you in a, sp in a special way, then I think it's a great, YouTube is just a great resource in general. Um, but yeah, let's talk about some of the top books for test prep. So I'll let Cheryl jump into the ACT and then I'll I'll talk a little bit about the SAT as well. Okay, awesome. So again, um, right at the top of the list is the official guide for um, ACT prep guide. It's the official ACT prep guide, or if you have spent any time with me at all, you know I call it the big red book. Um, and this book is, it's intimidating. It, like all of our books that you're gonna see, if you go and purchase them, they are intimidating text because they do contain so much information. Um, so what's nice about this book is it is produced by ACT using retired ACT questions. So it is going to be your closest practice to what the ACT you take is actually going to look like. So that's really um, comforting in that you know that these are questions are going to be modeled after the exact questions that you're gonna see on the test. Um, it gives you five full practice tests, which is fabulous because it's very important that you actually practice a few of these tests before um, going in to take it. And in addition to those five full tests, it also gives you access when you purchase the book to another 400 question um, online bank of questions. So that's also um, 
pretty generous for ACT. The thing, uh, if I were to do a, a con about this book, um, it is that it's very light on strategies in that it doesn't offer a whole lot of tips and tricks to, to the test. And of course they wouldn't because why would they give away their magic um, to, to you? They want you to be able to figure out how to do well on this test. So um, to compensate for where they don't have strategies, we have things like um, the Princeton Review and Cracking the ACT. Um, it has, again, this one has more strategies and um, eight practice tests, but they are not ACT released questions. Um, so they have been uh, created by Princeton um, in order for you to practice. And so oftentimes these questions are harder than what you will see on the ACT. And so if you're in my classroom, you know that sometimes I really work you hard in the class so that when this test comes around, you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. So McCracken kind of has that, but, and they also have eight full tests. So between the two books, you're now up to 13 practice tests, and that's a lot of time that you would be investing. Um, those students uh, who are looking to move from your low 30s into those upper 30s, this is definitely a good solid resource for you. And if you were just to purchase just one, this would be the one that I would suggest. Um, and you then use the combination of the online resources. Um, our third book is, I think, the Barron's Premium Guide. And um, what I like about the Barron's, it's like a whole bunch. Uh, they do a, a huge guide, which covers all of it. And then Barron's kind of got smart and said, how about you just want to study the English section or the math section? And so you can look at just that piece um, and through the Barron's part of it. So the next one is, um, like I said, the big red book. This is our magic black book. And it's less concerned with actually teaching you the skills that you need for the ACT. It is geared towards teaching you tips and strategy and how that test is laid out. And so that once you can predict what the question is asking you, you stand a better chance of upping your score because you're familiar with how they're going to ask the question or where the answer to the question is located when we're talking about the reading and math sections. And so, um, it does not, however, have any practice tests. So you'll wanna make sure that you combine that with those websites that we talked about earlier, um, the Khan Academy or the ACT Academy and those that we wanna do for there. Um, the next one is, um, it, again, split up. We have the Complete Guide for Reading and English by Erica Meltzer. Um, again, she just said, hey, I wanna focus just on these. Um, these two sections uh, did and some great things and she teaches skills in those things so you're gonna learn all that punctuation that you probably learned in elementary school she's gonna remind you about it talk to you about subject verb agreement and prepositions and one of my favorite which is redundancy so all of those things will be contained inside of that book plus some tips on decoding the reading questions and then the last one is McGarl Hill's 50 skills for math um, and it works just like um, Meltzer's English and reading, only it does for math. And so it, it takes down and it breaks down the skills that you will need for that test. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. That's great. So I'll talk a little bit about sort of the SAT equivalents that I recommend, especially from my time as a tutor and stuff like that. So the first one that um, really used to be like the book, but I'll tell you why it's not the book anymore, is just the, the SAT study guide created by College Board. Um, and so basically what it is is eight full-length practice tests um, with like answer keys and kind of explanations for the, um, you know, for why the answers are what they are. So that's, that's very helpful. The reason that it's not like the quote unquote the book anymore is that it's online for free. Um, so that's a good reason. <laughs> So all eight of the practice tests are online. If you just go to collegeboard.com, you can kind of find them and print them out if you want um, or do them online. So that's kind of a free, a great like free immediate resource for getting started. Um, 
if you you know if you're planning to prep for months and months like you can kind of run into the problem where you're using like if you're using sections as practice tests like you at, at a certain point you basically run out because like you can kind of save those as the full practice test which is i recommend saving you know at least four of them for that uh but then you kind of run out of problems to do that are authentic so we can kind of talk about remaining books and remaining ways that you can get access to problems. Um, one thing I like to do is just have students do the SAT question of the day. Um, so what that is, is you can kind of get, you can put in your email address, your school email, for example, and just every day the College Board sends you an email with one SAT question um, and an answer to it. So you, you try to solve it and then you get the answer. Obviously this is not like a comprehensive thing, but it's really nice because it kind of keeps you thinking about it, even when you're, you know, like it, it reminds me, it reminds you to do it. It kind of is like, it comes in the morning. So it's like one of the first things you do, which is kind of, it's nice just to like sort of have that continuous engagement with it while you're doing it. Um, I, the second one is basically the, it's called the black book, um, the SAT prep black book. So it sounds much like the ACT black book. But basically what it is, is it's really, really strong on the strategies and advice. Um, and that's one thing that you can kind of see is like either there, I mean, in some cases it's a mix, but either there's like, there's some books that are just all strategy and some that are all like problems basically. Um, and this is very, really a strategic book, um, which is nice, but you can't really use it without actual practice problems. Um, and so for the, non you know so basically like the other problems that you can do like in the, i think one of the best like ways to actually do practice problems is the princeton review version it's you know cracking the sat so i really like that one because the problems are a little bit harder than the actual sat problems in a lot of cases um so sometimes like when i was working as a tutor i would have students like start with other easier often like official practice problems and then as they started to really get it they would move on to the you know the Princeton review version and that that's really good because you know you, you can kind of get like that sense when you actually take the test like I, I've had students tell me like hey that test was really easy or you know like it felt really easy after doing the Princeton review so I wouldn't necessarily recommend starting with it because it can be kind of discouraging but once you, like once you kind of have been prepping for a few months, it's a really good resource in that sense. Um, and the other one is just the Barron's SAT book. Um, that one has a number of practice tests. It also has a diagnostic test, which kind of helps you think about like the, just kind of like thinking about your weaknesses systematically, which is really important because you wanna really figure out what problems you struggle with and what you, you know you can kind of target your attention towards because that's the quickest way of building up your score um and you know often like the Khan academy is really great for that because it, it can help you diagnose problems um but i think just kind of an overarching theme of these books is really like there's no book that will be super helpful unless you're studying like proactively and really thinking about your weaknesses so yeah so those are my thoughts i really like the um the Princeton Review book for like the harder problems, um, the SAT Black book for strategy, and then just like the official SAT tests, which are now online. Um, and then also just the Barron's book is, is great as well. Um, all right, so let's talk about kind of holding yourself accountable uh, in terms of prepping. So we're gonna kind of transition into the second part of this webinar. Did you have anything else, Cheryl, about the books before I moved on? Is that are yeah, no, I think I think that I think we covered those pretty well. So awesome. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of more of the motivational or staying motivated half of the the webinar. So let's let's talk about this. Um, I'm sure you've heard all of these tips before, but I think if we I'll talk first and then if Cheryl, if you want to like kind of jump in and we can kind of talk about what we've been doing to or what we've seen work to kind of accomplish these things. Um so the first thing is like setting and visualizing an end goal. Um, this is something, especially for me, is like been really useful because I'm working on my my dissertation. Um, I'm doing a PhD, so it's kind of 
you know, in terms of like finishing it, like just imagining the finished goal of like having a score that you, you know, really want or is really competitive for your dream school. It's not really about like, I mean, obviously it is to an extent, but like the day to day of like studying for 30 minutes or if, you know, a practice session goes badly, it's not, you know, try to keep in mind what you're actually aiming for and not viewing it like the preparation stuff as something that just happens endlessly or something that's going to just go on forever like you want to really be working towards a goal and that's the only way to like really keep yourself accountable like in terms of doing it every day because if you don't have an end goal eventually you'll just kind of drop off um i like to make an accountability calendar um so this is like what i do is i i write like a i write goals out every day um or almost every day that i'm like work working basically we'll talk about that in a minute um and then if I hit those goals, I actually literally bought like smiley face and sad face stickers for my calendar. And it's it's really like they're like for third graders, but um, it really actually helps me like because I can kind of see the visuals and just like I, I have my calendar. And I, if I hit the goals. I put like a, a smiley face sticker um, and I literally just like, you know, that that's actually really helped me hit my daily goals. So if you. Um, if you have whatever system you you have, if you're like a visual person or more of a, you know, if, it, if something else works for you, that that's really good. But I think writing out the goals is key. Um, working in sort of short focused time blocks is another thing. So instead of saying like, oh, I'm going to study, you know, I'm going to study today. It's like, you know, maybe it, it could be like four hours or two hours, but like you're checking your phone, all that stuff. Like you actually don't need to study like that long every day to really improve your score. I think a lot of people think like, oh, if I study like six hours a day, you know, whatever, I don't know. Um, especially over the summer, like the summer coming up and stuff like that. But what I do is um, I really try to like have hour to an hour 15 minute blocks um, and then take like a 15 minute break and then go back. And that really keeps me focused. Sometimes I like put my phone away or just kind of like, tune everything out. Sometimes I put like, I actually have like the noise canceling headphones. So sometimes I use those or just kind of, I'm like kind of try to be like completely locked in and then even like set a timer. And when that timer goes off, you're like done for that block. So that works for me. Um, I guess stretching and exercise are really important. Just like, especially for me, like if I put it off to the end of the day, I often don't do it. So I try to do it like around lunch or right before lunch or even just like earlier in the morning. Um, the last thing is like self-care is very important and just, um, taking planned breaks. Um, so like, don't let a day just like become an off day or like a day off, like try to plan it. So like actually going back to my calendar, what I do is like, I like cross it out. Um, and that's just like a vacation or just right vacation. Um, and I, I plan that a few days in advance at least so that I know that I won't be working that day. Um. But yeah, Cheryl, do you have any thoughts on this? Like what, um, what works for you? Those are awesome. Um, I love the fact of getting up and exercising early because I mean, everybody knows by the time you go home at the end of the day or you've already done all of your stuff, you're just tired. You don't want to do it again or do it at all. And so getting up early and doing that, and that's one of the things that I stress to my students when they're actually testing for this test is that they give you those planned breaks man you have your water your snack you get up and you move leave the test room go down get a drink um, walk around get that blood flowing again it allows you that opportunity um, to get moving again and it gets the blood flowing back up to your brain i tell my students all the time you got to get moving because blood will pool in two places in your feet and in your seat so after you've been testing for two hours in something and that's just through the math and english sections you need to get up so you can finish that test strongly and so that idea of stretching and working out and, and staying um, in uh, active will allow you to help balance the stress of the anxiety of getting ready for this test. Um, the other thing that has worked for a lot of my students in the past is having a study buddy. I know that sounds so nerdy and corny, but I told you at the front I was a pretty big nerd. So um, making someone else help you be accountable, you know, especially if there's two of you and you guys are both trying to get into the same schools, so you can go to school together, whatever, and you want to challenge each other to, you know, 
keep doing that, working towards that calendar, working towards those goals and, you know, studying um, for your set time every day. Um, so those are some really awesome ideas. So. Yeah, no, those are absolutely good. I think that like, especially with the accountability uh, portion of it, like having someone to talk to, you know, maybe even once a week or more, is just like, even just having that conversation of like, hey, did you get your prep in today or like this week? Um, how did that go? I think that's a really useful way of just kind of keeping yourself accountable. Um, and then also, you know, it helps you focus on the end goal because I think when something becomes really personal, like just like, you know, it's your own thing. You don't talk to anybody about your test prep that much. Like you kind of just say like, well, it's not super important because like I'm not affecting other people. But I think just that like being able to talk about it is a really good way of actually staying motivated. Um, so let's talk about some tips for success. So if you want to jump in, Cheryl, and then I'll I'll talk a little bit about the eight, like the SAT. Uh, yeah, yeah, it. sure. Yeah, let's start with um, the idea of one of the first thing that you need to do is you have to have a plan um, and a place to prep at home. Um, you really just, you know, spreading everything out on your bed. If that's what works for you, that's fine. Um, I was a great spread it all out on the bed studier. Um, but I had to plan that time. It wasn't like I could just willy nilly pick up my stuff and um, study. So you, I needed to plan that time, especially when it comes to the ACT. And so make sure that you have a designated time um, that you know you can consistently work on um, your test strategies, your test prep. Um, the one of the other things that is really is that it, it, you got to keep this realistic, guys. Um, Going into it, like Kevin said earlier, hey, I'm gonna do this for six hours every day. Let's, let's, that's just not realistic. The sun's gonna come out, you wanna go and get out on the river or go play football or whatever it is. And so um, the idea that you can keep things and still do all the fun stuff too. So you can still study and get out and do the things that you wanna do. So you wanna make sure that you keep those um, time constraints to what you can manage. And so if you have one day that you can do a longer time, do the longer time and then do the shorter times on the other days. So those are usually very helpful. Yeah, no, those are great thoughts. I think, yeah, I think for me, like I used to really compare studying for the SAT or the ACT to like, you know, sort of exercising. Like, you, you know, I had students who would come and say like, hey, I did like four hours on Saturday you know, but only on Saturday. And then like, they would be surprised that their scores weren't going up. Um, and really like what you want to do is just like, I mean, if you, you don't like, ex like when you, you know, when you work out or like, you know, go for a run or something, you don't run for four hours, like once a week. Um, obviously you do want to do the practice tests, um, especially as you get into the prepping, but like really to, to, to get started, like, you know, just doing like 30 minutes a day or an hour at most. Um, and then, but doing that like five or six days a week is really, I think the best way to, to like start ramping up with the um, kind of just getting ready for the tests. Knowing the starting point and your target score, um, again, is really important, especially like, you know, if you're applying to, you know, say Harvard, that's one thing. But if you really go on the website and look at what your what the middle 50% of the SAT or the ACT score is, um, you should aim, you know, in most cases, it isn't a perfect score. Um, so you should aim for a score that like falls within or above that range. But, you know, if it, if the score, for example, if the middle range is a, a 30 to a 32 on the S on the ACT and a, you know, 1200 to a 1300 on the SAT, I'm just making this up, but you don't need, you know, a 36 or a 1600 necessarily like it's obviously if you get that that's great but you know you like focus on getting your score up into that range first and then you know maybe trying to improve for the sake of merit scholarships or broadening your options for college but don't you know don't just say like i'm gonna i'm gonna do perfect and anything less is you know a failure or something like that because that really can set you up for failure um, definitely doing the practice tests um, and really trying to self-diagnose what you have gotten like wrong consistently and looking at the answer key is really important. I think that like a lot of times students take the practice test and then they score it but they don't actually read the answers. Um, so what I, I what I recommend usually is just like 
having them take the test and you know that's already like three hours and then taking a day off and then going back and just like looking at um like really looking at the answer key and like figuring out maybe you score it on Saturday like say if you take it on Saturday and just score it and see what you got and then like take Sunday off and then Monday like actually go through and read all the answers that you got wrong and figure that out because that's the best way to like really um, figure out like what you're getting consistently wrong, what concepts you're missing, or sort of what you don't understand consistently, um, and that's going to be the the best way to really guarantee that you bring up your score over time. I'm um, gonna jump in on that one. Yeah, if that's okay, Kevin. Um, when um, one of the things that I tell my students all the time is you can take tests all day long, but if you're not studying the answers to that test and the why yeah. your answer wasn't the right answer or why the right answer is the right answer. It's not going to help you improve. You have got to look at why did you choose that answer and think it was right. Um, so that's really important. Taking the test, we see a, a natural increase simply because students are now familiar with the test. They've taken it once or twice. That's what we call a natural growth. But it's that you don't start really intentionally improving scores until you start looking at why you chose that answer and why ACT answers they said their answer was the quote best answer and where in there did you miss that line um, so reviewing those answers is critical information for students um, just about as much information uh, important really as studying the skills that are going to get you to be able to answer the questions yeah no that's a great point and i think that just like figuring out what the logic of the test is over time by reading those answers is really crucial and especially i think that's what separates like often a you know a pretty good score from a close to perfect score in a lot of ways or someone who can kind of is capable of that score um i think you know the final thing is like a lot of people you're not alone like taking this test um and a lot of people a like take obviously like millions of high schoolers take the test every year or i don't think it's it might be around a million i forget um but like hundreds of thousands of people take it every year and obviously there are people with like many many years of experience teaching only the SAT and the ACT so definitely like use the resources we talked about and ask ask experts because I guarantee that like if you're struggling with some concept or some problem like there are going to be a lot of other students your age who are doing the same thing and like having the same issues so definitely look online and like don't feel like you have to obviously you have to study on your own and like do that portion of it but like you can kind of outsource your problems and figure out you don't have to like just be left in the dark with a lot of things you can really find answers online like look at trustworthy sources but you know Khan Academy going back to that like all of the resources we've talked about are really really good and can address like a lot of the the more difficult concepts especially so um all right so in terms of like staying motivated um i think one thing to think about this is more you know i'm not like a career coach or something but i think thinking about like what your quote unquote why is like everybody's why is different and i think this goes back to goal setting so think about like you know for me like when i was taking the sat it wasn't or the gre it wasn't like to get a great score on the sat or the gre it was to go to the college that i wanted to go to um so I guess like trying to not do it for the sake of getting a high score, even though that's great, but like thinking about the end, like the ultimate end goal is that this test is going to be a part of your package or part of your college application. So that I, I think keeping that broader picture in mind, but like whatever motivates you um, is pretty important. I, I think you want to be a little bit cognizant of your burnout. Um, so if you if you just feel like consistently, you know, it's hard to like stay motivated or just hard to concentrate, um, fatigue. I mean, first of all, this is like a really challenging time. So that's pretty common and like, but just like being cognizant of that in yourself. Um, and then as Cheryl said, just like, you wanna not only take the tests, but you wanna really go over your answers. Um, so don't just like take a test and then score it and put it aside, like really um, do, you know, in my opinion, like I think it's a great idea to take the test score it do that put it aside for a day and then come back to it and look at all the answers and like 
really look at like the explanations for why you got stuff wrong. So in that way, like you're kind of targeting your um, like how you're improving versus like, I think it can be kind of discouraging if you're just still, you know, if you're scoring, but like you don't understand why you got something wrong because you, you, you don't know how to fix it at that point. Um, and I'll let you take the last one, Cheryl. Um, yeah, and so uh, one of the things that we looked at and we want them to really consider is um, you talked a little bit about um, the tips for success here that we want to mm -hmm. make sure that we leave them with the idea that everybody can be um, successful, successful here on these tests. And um, I know for sure that, you know, just like uh, the ACT, um, the SAT, there are ways to go into that test feeling confident and successful and not letting those tests intimidate you. So one of the first things that you need to make sure that you have is that idea of, like we talked about before, is we have um, know your why for this idea. What is the point that you're um, really looking for? Is it just to get into the school um, or are you looking to do um, some other um, or are you, obviously it's to get into the school that you wanted to get into um, and to not just to go in and say, I got a 36 on the ACT. Although I have several students that I think would say, I got a 36 on the ACT. So um, I think that's a really solid answer for a lot of them. And just make sure that as you are moving through this process, that you are monitoring yourself for those ideas of, of um, stress and burnout. And this test is not the end of the day because you get to retake it. It's not a mm. one and a done thing. You can um, retake these tests as you need to. So that's kind of a student. I think students should be able to take some comfort in that. So um, yeah. And it, I'm not sure. Did we have any questions that came in on our Q and A there at the yeah, end? Yeah. Let's okay. take a look. So we'll leave it open for just a minute for questions, but if nothing comes up, um, yeah, let's just leave it for a sec. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, I know that SAT has, um, they canceled, I think, their spring test as well, didn't they, Kevin? They did, yeah, for May. Um, all right, so it doesn't look like there are too many questions, but Thank you so much for joining. Um, it's been a great, it was great to, you know, have us have you with us this afternoon and do all that. Um, talk about something that maybe isn't as interesting, but is ultimately pretty important for the SAT, uh, or, or I'm sorry, for college and just doing that. It looks hey, like Kevin. there is a question, yeah. yeah. Um, Lisa would like to know how they sign up for, um, where they send a question a day. And yeah. So, go no, that's ahead. A, Yep. That's a great question. Um, I think if you Google, if you just Google College Board SAT question of the day, um, it's going to be like, it, it should come up and it should ask for your email address and just have that sort of um, like some prompt like that. And then you should get a confirmation in the email. I like to do it with my school email, um, or I, that's what I did when I was in high school, just because it wasn't, um, I don't know, it, it can like clutter up if you miss a day or two um, and you can ultimately unsubscribe once you finish your prep. But for me, that was a really nice, um, a nice thing to do. Uh, it was a, a, just helpful for like kind of keeping me oriented, I guess. And I think Magoosh also um, has something going on with their free app that provides that question of a day idea as well. So check into Magoosh's blog and see if you can find that um, there, so. Great. Any other questions? All right. So we'll, I think we'll end it there for now. Um, but otherwise, it's been a pleasure with having you with us this afternoon and um, good luck with everything. Uh, good luck with the prep and don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, our information should be in the email you got to register. So thank you so much. Thank you.